My name is Rupa, and I am from Cumulus Networks. Um, network interface configuration on a Linux NOS. I think this is the most lightly loaded topic in, in, in the entire conference. There is no BPF, there is no TCP, and, and checksums. Um, so, okay, a bit of context. Uh, I want to start with a bit of context. People have stopped really talking about network interface management. It's actually either a solved problem or people are totally, completely ignoring the problem or they've found other ways to do network interface management on Linux. So uh, context is necessary here. I work at Cumulus and Cumulus was the first uh, company that wanted to bring Linux disaggregation and Linux ecosystem to routers and switches. These are enterprise grade routers and switches. So, and they wanted to, and it's a big shift. Uh, the main purpose was leverage existing Linux ecosystems and tools and uh, mainly bring the automation of Linux to routers and switches, uh, which means that make the existing um, tools and existing automation tools work, the ones that worked on your server, make it work on your routers and switches. And when they started, um, the founders and Shujit, who's one, one of the people sitting in the, in the audience, they started building a team of uh, a mix of people, people uh, from the closed source, uh, well, I would say the darker side of networking, um, from routers and switches, switches uh, who were used to do uh, configuring a router or a switch via CLI and a few of the people from the OS distribution world. So it was a nice mix of people. It has been fun. But then when uh, this leads into why I got involved in this whole network interface management problem is so when people came, when, okay, when we said, we told people that we are accelerating the Linux kernel data path uh, using a switch ASIC. So when a networking guy testing our box uh, started configuring a VLAN and it didn't work, it, they started blaming the kernel. Oh, the kernel, Linux kernel doesn't handle VLANs or it doesn't handle VLANs the way it's done easily on a CLI in any other vendor box. So, and being one of the kernel maintainers at Cumulus, yeah, everything, I was getting called into every other network configuration problems. So, uh, I guess goals of a network interface manager, I might ramble off the slides, I've forgotten uh, a few things that I've added to the slides here. So, the main thing is you make network interface management painless and easy. You give a config file and it has to configure interfaces for you. And, okay, for a NOS, when we started, we wanted uh, the network interfaces file to look exactly same, similar to what it looked on a server. So, uh, this slide just talks about a Linux-based NOS and Linux as your NOS. So many people, well, we all know that every network device today uses Linux in some way. Mostly are closed boxes, proprietary API, they usually have a CLI, they're black boxes. And what Cumulus started with, making Linux as your NOS, and as you've seen here, uh, Linux has been doing hardware acceleration since many, many years now. And uh, we wanted to bring that, we wanted to say that you, it's the same Linux that you run on the server and you accelerate using a switch ASIC. So we are targeting at open boxes, the Linux API to be your networking API, which is mainly Netlink. Um, and yeah, automate your Linux like your routers and switches like your servers. So this is just some analysis. People have stopped talking about network interface management. It used to be a problem. I, I remember when I got involved into network in interface management, I wanted to uh, get into a workshop at uh, LPC a few years back to talk about a few problems and suddenly that workshop got cancelled and I'm not sure if LPC conducts a network interface management workshop anymore. So my, uh, the theory there is I think uh, it's either a forgotten problem or for example desktop and uh, other operating system desktops mainly. Uh, we use Debian and I know that uh, Debian uh, the installer actually creates a small interface config file which is mostly E0, which is DHCP, and that's it. And there is nothing else. If that doesn't work, 
Uh, well, that usually mostly works, but then I've also seen that people on laptops, they just disable their network interface management manager because, yeah, they can do it with other ways. It's just a simple problem there. And hypervisors and container operating systems have moved on. They have orchestration tools, and it's usually a container or a VM has a fixed network interface attributes which are tied in with the provisioning tool, and that takes, takes care of uh, configuring the backend interfaces. Well, when we got uh, to tr when we moved to uh, existing server distribution on a router, we suddenly got trying to figure out how to do this whole massive network interface configuration. And like I said, we leverage most of the existing Linux networking components. For example, Quagga is an example, LLDP. It's all existing out there, and we try to improve it. We test it very much in production systems and in data center environments, and we make them robust. So, and for network uh, operating systems, we have seen that mostly the configuration is static, mostly cookie cutter configuration. You create a hundred VLANs on an interface uh, and configure some uh, configure port speeds and scale. We run a ton of attributes, uh, sorry, a ton of networking daemons, ton of protocols. We enable a bunch of things in the kernel, so it's a ton of attributes to configure on the interface. So we started with the goal that we will, um, we wanted, like I said, we wanted our, uh, the automation tools already configuring network interfaces on a server. We wanted the exact same automation tools to continue work on, a, on, our, on our router or a switch. So our goals were keeping it extendable. Uh, the network interface manager should take on add-on modules to configure any special things on a net network OS and not do certain things on a server. And we, okay, and we wanted to do the special networking router switch things using system policies. The system would drop in a policy file and that would uh, make specific things work for a for a NOS. And remember that uh, the hardware doesn't support all the functions that the kernel supports. So we wanted uh, the network interface manager to understand that via policies and yeah, not allow certain things. So that's when we started the search of a network interface manager. And um, I think I've covered most of this. So Debian came with IF up down. So when we shipped our initial OS, we did ship with IF up down. I, if, I don't know how many people work, have worked with a Debian distribution or a derivative of a Debian distribution, but it's mainly an ETC network interfaces file, and you have some static config in that, in that file. But we soon realized that IFFDAM was, it could do basic VLANs. It used the old VLAN API, vconfig, and um, it could do a bridges. It could, one, the old kind of bridge, the, not the VLAN filtering bridge, and basic bonds. But yeah, we soon realized that it, we could not put go production with it because it had issues. We, if we wanted to load, um, reload a config, you had to down an interface. And people in the networking uh, world, they don't really like, on, especially on a switcher or router. So then I got involved into, yeah, like I said, mostly they came as kernel problems. And then I wanted to fix, do something because of all these bugs piling up. And then I started IFF down. I was doing a little bit of Python during those days. So I thought it would be an easy problem. And I started, uh, uh, the main thing in IFF down too was a dependency graph of all the stack, various stacking of network interfaces that we do on Linux. Uh, for a bond and then bridge and VLAN interfaces and so on. So that uh, we have upstreamed this uh, to Debian and you can probably find it on some versions of, of Ubuntu as, as well. So in IFF, IFF to uses the same ETC network interfaces file. It's just that uh, it does a lot more than what IFF down did. We wanted to keep the pluggable architecture of IFF down, IFF down, so you could drop in a script and that could for additional interface config, and that would uh, that worked well for us because we wanted to add additional modules for STP and so on. I'll cover that in the next slides. And we wanted the, yes, the interface configuration had to be 
templatable or templ yeah, you, templates because like I said, if people want to configure 100 VLANs on a, on a trunk port, making them add config for 100 VLAN devices was not an option. So the easiest thing, sorry, the easiest thing was to use an existing templatable language like Python, and Python has, we, I did integrate some uh, Mako template engine into IFFBound too, which uh, like in this example, you can see made the config much smaller. So the next few slides, I uh, do cover um, examples. And in general, yeah, like I said, IFFBound 2 is, uh, has become a sort of a buffer like people, people in Cumulus, they think that, okay, if it's a, they usually come to me as it being a kernel problem and I have done to has been a nice buffer in between. Oh no, you can solve this problem outside the kernel and maybe an I have done to via policy and so on. So in general, if any of my kernel patch gets rejected, it ends up in as a Python code in I have done to. Uh, so the basic, Config is physical port config or link attributes. We use ETH tool. We, uh, we configure all our switch, switch ports using ETH tool, the speed duplex config. And uh, what we did in terms of policy was our, we have the port manager which works with the vendor SDK and it knows the speeds of every port, that default speed the port works in and so on. So our port manager actually creates an IFF down to um, policy file, which um, IFF down to implicitly configures. And then MTU, yeah, MTU was, we still need to do work on MTU. MTU throughout the interface, in MTU propagation throughout the stack, uh, in various layers of the interface stacking, is still a bit, uh, it requires a little bit of automation because bonds, we realize bonds, the MTU travels from the bond to the slaves and on a bridge it travels the other way around. So we had to hide all these uh, in the interface manager. L3 attributes, again, this is an example. Um, we use IP route two or direct netlink API to kernel. Yeah, in the process, we, we, us we usually use IP route two uh, because it's the fastest way to add new features. But over the years, because of some Python performance problems, we have developed a Netlink library in Python, which we use. Um, bonds is another simple example. In terms, um, in terms of policy, we want to restrict config of uh, modes, bond modes, restrict them to what the hardware supports. So what we've do done is that we have again controlled that in into, with policy files. Bridging. I only cover the VLAN filtering bridge here, uh, but yeah, this is again a simple example. We have, an, we have a mode or an attribute on a bridge that configures it in a VLAN filtering mode or not. And this is another example of yeah, we have tried to find a balance between um, the people coming from the old uh, networking background on um, routers and switches to the Linux world. The access port uh, sends and receives untagged ports and, and so on. Yeah, bridging policies, one is prohibit addresses on a bridge port. The other one that I forgot to mention here is uh, Linux allows, you can enslave a VLAN device under a VLAN filtering bridge, which is not really necessary and it's, we can't really translate it to hardware, so we drop in a policy to bar from such errors. If it's a VLAN filtering bridge, if the bridge already understands VLAN, then do not enslave a VLAN device under the bridge. STP, uh, yeah, STP, I realize, I didn't know about this either, but STP has a lot of attributes to configure. And uh, we, for bridge configuration, we usually use BRCTL or IP route 2 or Netlink. Uh, for speed, we are moving 
completely to Netlink. And ST, we use STP in user space. Uh, there is an MSTPD daemon on SourceForge, and we have, yeah, we have a few patches on it. And uh, yeah, this is on the on the right. There is an example of some STP attributes. And one example of an STP policy. Yeah, we all, one default policy is we enable STP uh, on every bridge that we configure. And something like VXLAN, you don't want to enable STP on a VXLAN port, which is uh, transmitting uh, encapsulated frames into the network. So we also support IGMP snooping attributes. The bridge driver, Linux bridge driver, can act as a IGMP querier. Uh, this is a picture showing a snooping switch. Again, we use IP Route 2, Netlink, or BRCTL. Here's an example. Next one is VXLAN tunnel endpoints. Uh, remember that this is a switch uh, or a TAR switch, and usually a VTAP a virtual tunnel endpoint uh, translates end device VLANs to a VXLAN or a VNI. So we, we simply use a bridge. Uh, and a VXLAN uh, device for every VNI. And the VLANs, if you want a L3 device for the VLAN, we create a VLAN device on top of the bridge. This is an example of the config. As a policy here, what we do is we, to enforce mapping of the VLAN to VNI, we configure VLANs on the bridge ports uh, in a way that only that particular VLAN traffic goes into the VXLAN device. And then the VNI, VXLAN device translates that into uh, the VNI. So VRR, VRR is uh, a virtualized router redundant router. Um, there is a lot of, there are actually protocols written for this. Uh, it's called VRRP or something. But um, what we realized, realized that what people want really is, uh, they don't need, a, you can do a lot of things without running the protocol. And we support VRR and we do it by um, creating a Mac VLAN device on top of the bridge which carries the virtual MAC and IP. And the VLAN device on the bridge carries the original uh, IP and MAC for that VLAN, which is the routable MAC and IP. Again, address virtual is the line that actually translates to the whole MAC VLAN stacking on the, on the VLAN device. Address, address virtual, I think, came from, I, most vendors use that term to indicate a virtual Mac and IP. So VRFs. Um, VRFs was a recent addition, and we did some um, things to make the config easier. Well, we all know, I am hoping everybody knows about VRFs by now. David had a talk in the morning, and he has a talk um, tomorrow. Um, so in, in, the, in VRF, again, it's a device. There is a VRF. A VRF is represented by a master device, and then you have devices enslaved to it. So there is, again, a dependency issue. So I have down to we have added more logic to actually make that dependency, to do dependency checks and to make sure connections get cleaned up properly, devices get down in the particular order. There's an example here. VRF table is, uh, indicates that it's a VRF device to make it easier between a VRF device and a routing table match. What we did was uh, we created a keyword auto, which an IFF have done to main, manages the pool of routing table IDs that are allocated by a system admin to VRF. 
and we use uh, IP Route 2 to actually give a name. We, ma uh, we give the VRF device name to the routing table. We map it uh, in, a, in that way by using this mapping file as shown, which makes it easier to debug. You, we use the same name everywhere. And here's an example. So VRF blue, and there was a VRF red in the previous picture. And you can see the table IDs 1001 and 1002 mapped to the two VRFs. And once you have this config set up, um, it's, it, you use the VRF name everywhere. We added a bunch of system policies, again, to make it easier. Um, easier to har hardware off at from hardware offload point of view as well. VRF table ID reserved range to reserve the routing table IDs for VRF usage for routing so that we don't trip on, uh, I mean, it allows the system administrator to use other routing table IDs for others, other uh, things. VRF max count, uh, we, use, we do support multiple switch uh, ASICs. So we chose, this is, all these policy files are again external policy files that IFF down to can consume. Um, these are dropped by the system and our system um, takes the least common denominator of a number of VRF supported by, a, by the ASICs that we support. And VRF helper hooks, it also allows you to run any um, creation deletion hooks when a VRF is created or deleted. And then VRF sockets close and down. This was another one that to clean up sockets. That, that's about it. Um, any questions? So is your uh, ENI, the Etsy network interface file format, is an old if up down ENI file compatible with your if up down too? Yes, it is. And it is available in Debian, Debian right now. We we are in the process of upstreaming our new VRF changes, which will be going out this week. Um, any other questions? So it's, uh, I had pointed out a GitHub link as well. You could uh, download it from there. And yeah, we're trying to get it into pip. It's a Python, it's a Python program. So we're trying to get it into pip install as well so that it's easier to download it on any other distribution. But it, yeah, it does use the Debian ETC network interfaces file. So you mentioned that your operating system uses Debian. So are you going to uh, base your operating system on the kernel infrastructure on SwitchDev? We might. You might? We might. What year? <laughs> See, SwitchDev only supports L2 and L3, right? Today we support a lot, lot, more than, lot more than that. Like what are the main stuff which is missing in SwitchDev for you to use that? I guess right now we support a lot of things, IGMP, VRFs, uh, IGMP snooping, then we're getting into multicast, and, and a lot more, yeah. SwitchDev is... IGMP, what is missing in IGMP and SwitchDev? I don't know, actually, no, but... It uh, goes to the CPU, you get it? IGMP will just work, IGMP snooping? No, no, the snooping, of course, the hardware does trap, and you get it, sure. Sure. Shijit wants to answer that. I'll let him take it. I mean, you, you're one of the founders of SwitchDev, and then you say we might use it in an unknown no, 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 date. I, it doesn't saying. sound good, excuse me. Okay, no, no. So, um, not sure what is the answer we're looking for. We run a commercial program with commercial customers. For us to switch to SwitchDev, it is not sufficient that IGMP works. It's also required that IGMP interaction with ACL, IGMP interaction with policers, IGMP interaction with any and all uh, replication limits that we want to put on it all have to work, right? So this is what we have today is functionally equivalent to what SwitchDev does, but using vendor SDK drivers, as you know. 
if there was equivalency, there is, was no value in not doing switch dev. But it has to get to that point before we can say we can switch because our commercial release has to be able to support that. Right? It's, it's not a, as you know, we contribute code regularly, we contribute to messages and, and to conversations. It's not that we are trying to not do that, but the point is there has to be a, a point at which we can support our customers. In the service space, uh, you know, Red Hat, uh, you know, some people who are employed by Red Hat, so Red Hat roughly put half of the money of their paychecks to open source. So that's in your case, maybe you should contribute to open source yeah. and make it work. You know that we're <laughs> yeah. still a startup. <laughs> No, no, go, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, make, your, make your comment. I don't know what to say. No, no, if you are not finished, go for it. I wanted to... <laughs> okay, uh, when I was listening to you, um, I felt like a lot of what you were doing is similar to, for example, what uh, Wicked developers have done recently. Sorry, what was that? Uh, Wicked, the network interface manager used in newer uh, SUSE uh, distributions. Uh, also, the, the Lenart gang is working on systemd network D, which yes, threatens I, I to swallow everything. Uh, so, uh, did you consider to oh, coordinate yes. the effort and use perhaps some common back end with different front ends for your configs, SUSE configs, or health yes. configs? Yes, we have actually. So when we started, I did do a survey. Uh, we were interested in using Systemd Network D, but as you know, we started this two years back or three years back, and Systemd Network D was focused on containers. And yeah, it was again the same problems: large interface files, or how do you? Like I said, our box is open. We want people who are transitioning from the darker side to uh, the Linux config they need to understand, they need an easier way. So all those considerations. And uh, I have spoken at DebConf as well, and we do uh, work with the Debian guys. And the, most of the System D guys are also at the Debian. Um, they're around the Debian circle for System D. And we have talked about future plugins for IFF down 2 into System D and many other things. But yes, if we find something that will work, we do want to push for a universal interface manager because it doesn't make sense to configure a bond a different way in every distribution that you go. Mm, so at least for Red Hat, if up, um, system the network D and network manager, there's right now plannings going on for like, um, like exchangeable interface definitions, which is, yes. I guess, happening right now. Yeah, I have been part in the, of that conversation for on Debian as well, because Debian also has moved to Network Interface Manager, right? And sorry, again? Debian is now shipping with Network in, Network Manager. Sorry, it's yeah. called Network Manager, which is which used to be Red Hat's, right? The Network Manager. It's a GNOME project. Uh, free desktop, sorry, free desktop okay. project. But Red Hat ships that, right? Red Hat. Has yeah, we, we use it, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Even Debian, the default is Network Manager, and there has been a uh, debate going on whether they should move to Systemd Network D. I think Systemd Network D is going to win because everything is Systemd right now in Debian. Um, mm, yeah, but they, they don't overlap with their features, and they will not. So uh, the internal planning was happened already, and Systemd Network D will definitely not support some features and not that those one network D will, uh, network manager will only support like specific Wi-Fi stuff. Wi-Fi so stuff, yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah, let's see how Debian goes, but... <coughs> yeah, excuse me first, because I just arrived from the hotel, so I cannot fully understand your, your presentation. But maybe you maybe mentioned about the automation perspective, like, yeah, uh, like uh, we or you can set up the VRF in a continuous site. So what about the switch and the other louder side of configuration? Do you have any idea about that? Which, what kind of configuration? Like, Sorry. you can set up the VRF on the continuous side, right? This is a switch on the 
This oh, is really? a switch. Yes. I'm sorry about that. Yes. This is <laughs> yeah. a switch. Yeah, yeah, right. to make the switch look Because, it, because uh, tomorrow I show up to my presentation and we try to figure out the computer side from the computer side configuration to the switch side. So I, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, just one quick question: Did you consider, guys, or do you have any integration with CloudInit, where you can actually get the initial base configuration of the first interface, and then maybe, you know, yeah. what, what is CloudInit? You said There's, most of the cloud providers have, have kind of um, aggregated, or that's the project they're heading towards. Every cloud provider before that seemed to have their own. Um, way of providing base configuration information to the guest image. I mean, some of them would give you a, like a USB pseudo drive and other ones would, you had to talk to a certain IP address and download things. But cloud init seemed to be the way that that was going forward. I'm not sure exactly. I think it gives you a JSON file with the things in it. Um, oh, okay. What? Okay, yeah. So you need something that basically, if you're going to provision a thousand machines, you want to do it once, but you want to give each one a different set of data, but based on the same image, and you want to have them connect, and usually they set up something where they all connect, and you get a management channel, and then you go, go okay. from there. Okay, we'll look at that. But I've always found that most of these VM provisioning or server provisioning tools, they do the basic minimum, which... Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, if you were deploying at scale, you'd end up with the two-stage one. If you use this to boot something else, it's like we use Grub to boot Linux. Right. So, so actually, uh, for Kingless, we, we have two things. One's called Oni, and Oni can set up a hook to set up what we call zero-touch provisioning, which would actually generate the, the first config right. file. And between Oni and ZTP, it has waterfalls that are based on IP, IP ranges. You can use SCTP, you can use HTTPS. So we have that problem solved, but it's probably this is a format for our zero touch provisioning stuff to maybe go be able to interpret and say if you're using hosting between on prem and off prem, you can start from the same seed. Yeah, that's what you're saying. I mean, I just I know that every provider seemed to reinvent the wheel, and then they've gradually have converged on this project. That's all. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. So